former, I'll call it the former platform that they had put in front of the people of Ontario a number of weeks ago, the so-called People's Guarantee. Um, we already knew that that had a multi-billion dollar hole in it, that, that, uh, that their former leader, Patrick Brown, uh, and members of their caucus were either unwilling or incapable of explaining to the electorate how they planned, what they planned to cut, who they planned to harm, what they planned to put at risk in order to fill that multi-billion dollar hole. Well, we saw all four of the candidates vying for that leadership, including Doug Ford, who ultimately has become their leader. We saw all of them go one step further and promise that if elected as leader and ultimately elected as premier, they would get rid of the carbon tax. But the carbon tax is exactly how the conservatives had previously proposed to pay for some of the ongoing investments that they alleged that they'd be making. And I think a personal income tax cut. As well. And also a personal income tax cut. So knowing that they already had to fill a significant hole in their plan in order to make the numbers work and to cut recklessly in order to make those numbers work, now we know they have to do that and go that much further. Uh, and again, the question I have, and I, I asked this when I was at the Conservative Convention when they released the People's Guarantee in the first place, uh, it, you know, if you want to be a conservative, if you want to take the province backward, if you want to make reckless cuts, that's your choice. But I believe in 2018, the people of this province deserve to know exactly what you would cut, who you would harm, and what you would put at risk. I think you, if you have the courage of your convictions, you should be able to level with the people of this province and be honest about what you plan to do. And we haven't seen it from Patrick Brown, and we have not yet seen it from, from Doug Ford uh, as he's assumed the leadership of that party. Well, so we had Doug Ford on, on this show a couple of weeks ago, and we, we touched on that, on that subject, and his answer to me was that he is quite confident that he could find, so about $141 billion budget last right. year uh, in Ontario, that in order to fill that five to six billion dollar hole, that he can find 4% in budget efficiencies. Um, we didn't dig too deep on what those efficiencies look like or where he may find them, but that would be his answer if he were here, I think, on, on filling that fiscal hole. So there's a couple of challenges with what Doug Ford is suggesting. One is their hole is not four or five or six billion dollars. It was north of ten billion dollars, closer to about twelve billion dollars before Doug Ford and the rest of the candidates running for their leadership said that they would also get rid of the carbon tax. That number has now grown. It's somewhere in the neighborhood of a $16 billion hole in their plan right now. So when you're talking about that, that scale, that size of magnitude of cuts that would be required, it's unavoidable when you look at the provincial budget. It's unavoidable uh, that you would have to cut in health care. You would have to cut in education. You would have to cut in protecting, uh, uh, protecting our environment. You'd have to cut back on infrastructure investments. You'd have to take a really serious look at firing teachers, doctors, nurses. And you don't have to take my word for it. Uh, just a few days ago, an independent economist named Mike Moffat published an article in McLean's magazine saying that he'd taken a look at what the four candidates, including Doug Ford, were promising to do uh, should, should any one of them, and in this case, should Doug Ford become premier. And Mike Moffat's independent analysis said that at least 40,000 teachers, doctors, nurses, and other women and men who perform really core public services in all 444 communities across this wonderful province, at least 40,000 of them would be at risk of losing their jobs in order to make those numbers work. And it's not just about the jobs. I mean, that's critically important for those people and their, their livelihoods and their quality of life. But it's also what kind of horrendous ripple effect would that have on people across Ontario, lower income families, middle income families, young people. Uh, what, what kind of impact, what kind of ripple effect it would be devastating because the core services that we rely on as an enlightened, civilized province would be at risk. Healthcare, education, fighting, uh, fighting climate change, protecting our environment, building the infrastructure that our economy depends upon uh, so that it can continue to flourish. All of this is at risk and mm -hmm. all I would say to Doug Ford is just come clean, have the courage of your convictions and admit who you're going to put it to, at risk and who you're going to harm with your reckless plan. Well, when he was here and in, in, in some of his subsequent media interviews, he, he references the fact that he has run a fair-sized company and that he, he's good and thinks he can find savings in things like procurement that are not <coughs> job-related. Now, you were Minister of Transportation for over three years, yep. and you gave out a lot of contracts for road building and a number of other things. These things are RFP'd. They, 
people tender their bids on it. Yeah. Do you think that on the procurement side, there are billions of dollars of efficiencies mm -hmm. that could be realized? So there are a couple of things I would say. I, I recognize that uh, Doug Ford has said, you know, as, as a person who comes from the business world, he has the know-how to do this, that, or the other thing. I currently serve, obviously, as Ontario's Minister of Economic Development and Growth. I have a ton of respect for business people, for entrepreneurs, for people who uh, make the decision to, to put at risk themselves, to risk their capital, and uh, pour a ton of energy and resources at a personal level, again, into building businesses. People who have that entrepreneurial spirit really are at the backbone of our economy and, frankly, our province. And we rely on them, and I and the rest of our team in government respect them a great deal. Uh, but, but it's fundamentally different in government. And I will say, mm -hmm. as someone who served as Minister of Transportation, using our alternate financing procurement model in many cases, working closely with Infrastructure Ontario, we have a very, very strong track record of delivering projects both on time and on budget and transferring a ton of risk, cost risk, out to the private sector. It's actually the beauty or the magic of our AFP model. But most importantly, again, in 2018, when you are less than 90 days away from election day in this province, and there is the potential that someone, in this case Doug Ford, is actually promising to recklessly treat at least 40,000 teachers, doctors, nurses, and put at risk the core public services that people in Vaughan and people right across Ontario depend upon, it's not good enough to say in a very vague way, oh, trust me, I can find it. You actually have a responsibility when you want to lead this province. When you want to be responsible for my daughter's future and for the future of tens of thousands of other young girls and boys across this province, when you want to hold their health care system and their education system and their quality of life in your hand as premier, you have a core responsibility to level with the people of the province and explain exactly how you would get it accomplished. Because when you fail to do so, I would say that in the first place when you fail to do so, you're not demonstrating true leadership qualities. And secondly, we've seen this movie before. We have seen conservative leaders like Mike Harris and others come to the fore and in the past promise all gain, no pain, tax cuts, easy to find spending cuts and everything will be fine. And what happened in this province? We saw our health care system eviscerated. We saw no investments in our energy system. We saw public education thrown into chaos. Here in Toronto, we saw the Eglinton subway project killed and ultimately filled. They literally filled in the holes that had been tunneled to prepare for that subway. They took a major public asset in Highway 407 which generates huge returns on investment. They took that public asset and they sold it. And they sold it because fundamentally they had to make their numbers work and the rest of their fiscal plan wasn't adding up. And those are just two examples of the kind of decisions they've made in the past when they've said to the people of this province, just trust us. And I'm fond of saying, we know how ugly that movie was the first time. We in, we in this province understand that the sequel is always worse than the original. Oh, that's, yeah, I guess in most cases. The movie, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So they're going to put out a platform. He said he's going to have a very simplified five-point platform. So we'll give them the benefit of putting that out there and then, you know, I trust it'll be costed and then we can take a closer look at it. On, on the party side, just yesterday, a uh, couple of things happened both from the Liberal uh, perspective and from the PC perspective. And we're going to talk about the Liberal side mm -hmm. and the government in, in just a couple of minutes. But, um, You'll recall that when, when Patrick Brown resigned and Vic Fideli became interim leader, that he overturned a couple of nomination meetings that had been hotly contested and the right. people were complaining about the outcome. Just yesterday, the party overturned either three or four more four. nomination four, yeah. meetings. And also, interestingly, a, 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 an announcement went out from the par president of the PC party that Patrick Brown would not be allowed to stand for election as the MPP in Barrie, right. where he was elected from. Right. I, I caught this last night and immediately on social media, some of the journalists and columnists who cover Ontario were saying, geez, that's weird. The party had said it would be okay for him to re-enter the leadership race, which right. ultimately he decided to pull out. He right. wasn't removed from it. So it was okay to run for leader, but not okay to stand for election in one writing right. uh, as an MPP. Now, as someone who's an MPP as well, 
What do you make of that? How, how do we interpret that? I mean, clearly, I guess it was the leader that didn't want him, but it was the party president that put the, the statement out. How do, how do we interpret this series of events yesterday? Well, I think, it's, I think again, it speaks to the chaos um, and the, the lack of organizational harmony or unity that exists within Ontario's Conservative Party. And we talked about this a few minutes ago, the way that they were plunged into a leadership process, uh, the fact that they've gone through a very compressed timeline for their leadership, uh, their leadership selection and ultimately their choice of, uh, of going with Doug Ford. Uh, we've, seen, uh, we've seen that they are, they are not a unified party, and I know that they're saying they are, uh, but, but clearly, and, and frankly, interim leader Vic Fideli is also the person who in the first few days on the job went out there into the public domain and said it's, it's up to him to root out the rot. I mean, that's actually a stunning <coughs> indictment when you think about it for a political leader to say, someone who's served in that caucus for a number of years now, and someone who's obviously seen as a bit of a leader in that caucus because he was appointed by caucus as their interim leader, mm -hmm. that when looking at the party itself, they, there's obviously a lot of rot that has to, be, has to be dealt with. And now we see the other kind of shoe drops on this one, redoing nomination meetings, uh, now, as you pointed out, telling their former leader, who was then again pr approved to run for leader, that he's no longer qualified or wanted as a candidate in Barrie. All of this, to me, speaks to the kind of, um, to an organization that's in crisis. And again, I said a second ago, when you're running to be Premier of Ontario, when you're a team, when you're a political party that aspires to govern, and then ultimately you want to be responsible for our health care, for fighting climate change and protecting our environment, for our public education system, for investing in the kind of transit and transportation that we need in this province. We're, we're building it and we need it. You have, you, have to know, uh, you have to know how to organize yourselves. If you ultimately can't be organized within your own party, how in the world can the people of Ontario expect that you're going to have the wherewithal, the organizational capacity and wherewithal to govern the province? A province that is, as you pointed out, on an annual basis, about a $140 billion a year enterprise. Uh, and it's, it, to me, it makes it abundantly clear that they're not ready for prime time, uh, that, uh, that they, they continue to have an awful lot of uh, trouble within, within their own ranks, and uh, the people of this province deserve better. Now, having said all of that, the, uh, Mr. Ford has said to media that in the next election, and he, he said it here, um, that he and his party will win a large majority, uh, and some of the public opinion polls, which are Lately, I think they're, they're, they do show a PC lead, the size of the lead, the, the individual numbers attributed to each party's change a little bit. But you know, he, he's saying that, you know, that their party's united and that they will win this large majority right across Ontario. So as a liberal candidate yourself, um, how would you respond to that? Well, listen, political leaders will say things, uh, and, and people who have been following the career of Doug Ford will know that he has been saying things throughout his career uh, that can't necessarily be taken at face value. And I get, I get the importance of wanting to make sure that a team has good morale and feels like its spirits need to be boosted and wanting to put that spin out there. But I've also, as someone who's served in the legislature since 2012, but someone who's been active, as you pointed out, in politics in the Liberal Party for a number of years, I would say that any political a candidate or political leader who wants to take for granted the opinion of the people of this province uh, is, actually, uh, is actually taking a pretty big risk. The people of Ontario are smart, they are focused, they understand what it takes to build a strong economy, they understand what it takes to support a very positive quality of life in their communities. They have hopes, they have anxieties, they know that we've done res reasonably well over the last number of years economically. They know that we are building, that we're supporting public health care and education, and again, protecting our environment and building the infrastructure that our province needs. I don't fundamentally believe they want to put any of that at risk. And I think they also realize, when you look at the agenda that our government's pursued over the last number of months, that these are the kinds of policy thrusts, if I can say it that way, whether it's making college or university tuition more affordable for middle-income families and free uh, for lower income families, uh, whether it's making prescription medication free for every single Ontarian up to the age of 25. Because when you think about it, and I say this as a parent of two young kids, in a province as prosperous and as progressive as Ontario, there is no way that parents should have to choose between paying their mortgage or paying for life-saving medication for a young child. That just should not happen. 
So we've stepped in to help support that kind of positive outcome for the people that we're proud to represent. The people of this province want to see us continue to invest in them, build our talent pipeline, build our talent pool, lure more investment to this province, create more jobs. This is what we're focused on. We want to make sure people are participating fully in the economy. We want to make sure people have every single opportunity to become their best self. That's what we're focused on. And any politician who says 90 days out, don't you worry. I've already measured the curtains in our offices. I've already looked at the paint colors we're going to put up on the walls. We don't even have to have a serious conversation with the people of Ontario. And I think that's a politician that's uh, going to get a pretty hard life lesson over the next 90 days. And we're going to keep focused on exactly who we're fighting for. And that's the people of this province, people that we're proud to represent. We've noticed, uh, because we follow this stuff really closely, that the, the Premier and some of the people on your team have said this. It, it's, you know, when, when asked about the opposition, who's going to win the leadership, et cetera, et cetera, um, it's, not who we're fight it's not about who we're fighting against, right. it's who we're fighting for. Right. So certainly, the government has announced a number of measures that, uh, and the Premier has said, I've been in the room when she says, you know, I believe the job of government is to level the playing field and make sure that no one gets left behind. So these are the, si the types sure. of policy uh, initiatives that the government has announced. Yep. Now, we are going to talk a little bit about what's to come uh, uh, in, uh, in the government uh, starting on Monday, when I guess uh, w w the legislature was prorogued yesterday, right? and uh, an announcement came, came out that there will be a throne speech on Monday. Right. I think uh, a number of observers were caught by surprise because the thinking is that the legislature will sit really till maybe the end of April, first couple of days of May, and the election being June 7th. The writ period has to be 28 to 35 days. So this, this pressing the reset button now was kind of an interesting development that uh, we honestly, many of us didn't see coming. So we're going to want to talk to you a little bit more sure. about that. We're going to take a short break. Sounds good. Um, which will allow the people that are watching this while eating lunch at their desk <laughs> to go get a drink. Sounds and good. Uh, we'll be back in about 30 seconds. For 20 years, Sussex Strategy Group has helped companies and organizations navigate government and bring about successful policy change. Our team of experts understand that it takes more than meetings and phone calls to turn heads and change opinion. It takes insight, strategy, and deep domain knowledge to get things done. In a world that's constantly changing, one thing stays the same. Sussex Strategy Group helps you win. Visit sussex-strategy.com right now and let us help you today. Sussex Strategy Group, 20 years of getting you results. Looking to take your digital advocacy to the next level? Get in touch with our team at Sussex Adrenaline. Sussex Adrenaline is Canada's most awarded digital public affairs agency. Using our proprietary advocacy platform, Vox, supporters of our clients' campaigns have sent over one million letters to their local politicians advocating for change. Let us help you design your next advocacy campaign and get the results you need to win. Sussex Adrenaline, digital that actually gets you results. the MPP for Vaughan, Ontario's Minister of Economic Development and Growth, and Liberal candidate in the upcoming election. So Stephen, just before the break, we, we talked a little bit about uh, what what's happening more on the, the Liberal side of things. We talked right. at length about uh, the PC world, and hopefully by the end of the show we'll talk a little bit about the NDP. Okay. Um, it's kind of hard to get a read on that party for us, uh, although I understand tomorrow in downtown Toronto, Andrea Horvath is making a major announcement, and so we'll anxiously wait to see what's happening there. But so the government, the Liberal government, has prorogued the legislature, um, and we were explaining to some of our clients what that actually means. Uh, and there'll be a throne speech on Monday, and the throne speech generally is the government's opportunity to set out what the agenda right. is and the priorities are in the upcoming session. Right however abbreviated that session will be. Right, right. And so that's March 19th, and then on March 28th, uh, the government will be tabling the budget. Right. Um, and, and the finance minister announced last week, actually, that there's going to be a deficit in that budget. He 
very clear, and yeah. that received yeah. lots of media coverage of up to, I think what he actually said was up to about less than 1% of the provincial GDP, GDP and right. I think that GDP is about $795 billion, so the Give media said yeah. there's going to be an $8 billion de uh, deficit, which for some people um, makes it a bad budget, Just and I guess if the only measure you have of whether or not a budget is good or bad is if it's balanced or not. Um, I had uh, a Adrian Batra of the Toronto Sun on here last week, and, and I'll, I'll repeat, I think I'm going to reserve judgment on the budget till I actually see what's in it before deciding whether it's a good budget or a bad budget. So we um, talked just before the break about some of the initiatives that the government has uh, taken, the minimum wage. Right. And being the, the Minister of Economic Development, you talk to the business communities all the time. I do. So we went up from 11.40 right. an hour to $14 January 1st, and right. there's a legislated increase next <coughs> January 1st, 2019, that it should go to $15. Um, the PC leadership candidates were all unanimous in saying they'll, they'll leave it at 14, they wouldn't roll it back, but they would repeal the legislative requirement to raise it to 15 next year. And Doug Ford, and I, I you know, will take some credit for this, it was here the first oh. time I heard him say that uh, he wouldn't have the second increase to minimum wage, but he would instead um, have anybody that earns up to $30,000 a year not pay any provincial income tax, and that was his way of helping people at the, at the lower end of the income scale. So it's, it sounds like both parties would acknowledge that more help is needed for people at the at the minimum wage rate, and maybe it's a different approach on how to go about it. So, th so there are a few things that I would say. Um, I think it's interesting that Doug Ford has um, now started to pay attention and admit, uh, I suppose implicitly, that Ontarians who are at the lower end of the income scale uh, deserve government support. So again, that they can they can achieve uh, what they need to achieve for a quality of life. Uh, and, and survive in this province on a day-to-day -day basis so that they don't have to make that stark choice between paying their rent and paying for groceries or supporting something that their child might need if that's the case. Mm -hmm. So I think it's interesting Doug Ford is now talking that way. Um, but the challenge that I have with his approach on this is not about whether or not an income tax cut makes more sense than a minimum wage increase. And I'll come back to the minimum wage increase in just one second. What strikes me as really bizarre is that on the one hand he's He's admitting that people at the lowest end of the scale need help, but on the other hand, he refuses to tell those people exactly which one of the public services that they depend upon uh, he would cut and how aggressively he would cut. And we talked about this earlier today. We know, we know that in their plan, especially since they all promised to eliminate the carbon tax that used to be in their old platform, and by old platform I mean from a couple of months ago, um, by eliminating that carbon tax, the hole in their plan is now massive. Uh, we, we've said this earlier, we know that they need to fire at, at least 40,000 teachers, doctors, nurses, and others who provide core public services in communities around Ontario. That would have a catastrophic impact on every single Ontarian, but in particular, I would say it would have a particularly catastrophic impact on those people who are the most vulnerable. So it's fine to say like it's some kind of bumper sticker slogan or it's some kind of tweet as opposed to a you know, really well thought out policy. Well, I'm just gonna do this. But at the end of the day, if you're going to wreak havoc in their lives, if you're going to put them even further into the shadows and on the margins, and you're not gonna level with them about how you're going to do that, it just again speaks to me, uh, it speaks to me uh, and, and it suggests to me that he's really not ready for prime time. And he's not really genuinely serious about trying to help those people in their pursuit of more opportunity. On the minimum wage increase, I will say, and it's true, as economic development minister, I've had the chance in communities across the province over the last couple of months to speak with business leaders, uh, small, medium, and large sized business leaders, and to hear about some of the challenges they are going through in this regard. There's a couple of things for, for us to remember, and for your viewers to remember. Um, number one, we, we recognize that in particular our small business sector uh, needs our support and needs our help, especially as they go through a transition that might cause, them, uh, might cause them to have to rethink how they're doing business. And that's one of the reasons that a number of weeks ago we reduced the corporate income tax rate for small business from 4.5% down to 
to help our small business sector remain as competitive as they have been over the last number of years. That's a conversation that's going to continue. My colleague, Jeff Leal, who is responsible for the small business file, uh, will continue to engage with the small business sector. We'll have that conversation. We'll make sure that we're in a spot that helps them thrive as they've thrived over the last number of years. As a government, we're also going to continue to invest very heavily uh, in, I mentioned this earlier, the transportation infrastructure, other forms of criti critical infrastructure that we need for a strong economy. We're gonna keep investing in our talent pool. So for example, we're increasing by 25% the number of STEM graduates that we're gonna be producing in this province. Over the next few years, as a result of our decisions and our investments, Ontario will become the North American leader on a per capita basis in terms of producing STEM graduates. We're moving into AI and machine learning. Uh, we're actually going to be increasing the pipeline of those individuals who'll be graduating uh, with master's degrees in AI. This is all about creating uh, the kind of talent pool that will help us continue to lure investment to this province. So for example, my first day on the job as economic development minister was the day that Amazon announced that Ontario, the Toronto region, Ontario made the short list of 20 potential venues or, or communities for their second global headquarters. That's a $5 billion potential investment that could create up to 50,000 new jobs. And the original list had 238 places so across North America. So we made North the playoffs. America. We made the playoffs. That's and good. We made the playoffs. I one yet, but we made no, the playoffs. No, but, but let me point out, we made the playoffs not by offering them a tax break and not by offering them cash, but by talking about the values that are right at the foundation of this province, investing in our public services, creating a fantastic quality of life for the people who live here, for the people who want to live here, and ultimately showcasing how exceptional our talent pool is. And by doing that, we made the playoffs, as you pointed out a second ago, and we're going to be really competitive for the next round. So my point in all of this is to say, um, I, I know that we have some sectors of our economy that are dealing with the changes that we've made a minimum wage. But to me, as the economic development minister, I would say to you, in any, in any place around the world, when inequality um, goes sort of unchecked, when, uh, when those who are doing really, really, really well, like the exceptionally wealthy, when there's a gulf that continues to open up between those individuals and middle income families and lower income families, when that inequality continues to increase, it almost inevitably leads to social instability. And when you have instability in a community, in a province, it's always bad for the economy. Always bad for the economy. It impacts investor confidence. It impacts GDP. It impacts job creation. We don't want that to happen here in this province. It flies in the face of our core values as a province. That's one of the reasons. That's a key reason. It's an economic reason that our government is making sure that we don't let that inequality gulf or, or you know, that, uh, that gap uh, increase here in this province. So I, I want to ask you because there's there seems to be mixed messages coming. I, at at a macro level, the numbers on Ontario's economy numbers are great. Seem to be pretty good. They're great. The growth, no, GDP growth, the unemployment numbers, they look pretty good. Yeah. But at the same time, from Queens Park and from government, your government, we hear that people are being left behind and that this period of <coughs> economic stability and growth doesn't extend to everyone. And then we have the uh, Mr. Ford uh, the, the saying that he'll actually bring prosperity back to Ontario. Is, are we prosperous or aren't we? And, and, and if we are, are certain sectors doing better than others? Yeah. Well, these mixed messages we're sure. getting are hard to understand. Sure, so let's, let's take a quick second to look at the actual numbers. Since the depths of the global economic recession back 10 years ago in 2008, mm -hmm. uh, when it was pretty rough out there, we had like a seven month stretch where literally tens of thousands of jobs back in 08, 09, where jobs were lost. There was a point in time in that moment when there were people questioning whether the province of Ontario would ever produce cars again. And when you consider how historically important and currently important our auto sector is. That's just something that's remarkable to hear 10 years later. But 10 years later, because we chose as a government at that point in time to run a small deficit and to invest in our people and to invest in our infrastructure and to invest in a future where the economy could do well, we have, since the depths of that global recession, created about 800,000 new jobs. Those 800,000 jobs, north of 90% of those are full-time in the private sector and in, and in industries that have above average wages. 
So that's a really tremendous economic success story. At the same time, as you pointed out, we have GDP, we have economic growth that doesn't just lead Canada, it leads the entire G7. We have now been below the national average in unemployment for 36 consecutive months, and our unemployment rate, which hovers around 5.5%, is at its lowest today, lower than any other point in time in the last 17 years. So it is a really, really good economic story that we have. We know that that economic success hasn't been universally felt by every area, physically, geographically, in the province, and it hasn't been felt by every individual or every family. That's why we see, in some cases, a bit of that rising inequality that I referenced a second ago. We want to close that gap. We want to make sure that we have social stability. That helps improve investor confidence. That helps strengthen our economy. We also have challenges because I'm sure your clients, your viewers would know, we have NAFTA, for example. We have an American, uh, an American uh, federal administration that is, like I'd say, dip diplomatically unpredictable. Uh, our premier has been engaging relentlessly. She's talked to 40 governors south of the border. She's met with senators, congresswomen and men. I've had a chance to be with her in some of those meetings. Yeah. I think our message is penetrating. We saw some success led by our federal government, but also because of our engagement. Just a few days ago, after uh, President Trump had mused about slapping a 25% tariff on steel, which would have been disastrous for the province of Ontario, we see that Canada, and by extension, Ontario, has gained an exemption from those tariffs. So we've had some success, but we know there are challenges that sit right in front of us. Rising inequality, rising protectionism. This is why our government has decided a very brief prorogation of the legislature from just yesterday till Monday, no sitting days lost, no bills that were on the order paper will die. We'll be able to come out with a, an agenda-setting throne speech on Monday that will outline how our government intends to continue to deal with those challenges I referenced a second ago so that we can continue to thrive as a province. Then we'll have a budget on March the 28th, and we'll see what's in that budget. But it, you know, I think it's, it's clear that we are going to, as a government, continue to invest in our people. We're going to continue to invest in our infrastructure. We're going to build that strong economy, create jobs, and have a strong quality of life for the people that we are very proud to represent. So based on that, I, I'm going to paraphrase and say you would disagree with a statement that says we have to bring prosperity back to Ontario. It, it sounds like it hasn't left, or at least right now is a relatively good economic time. Well, it sounds like the kind of bumper sticker I'd expect on the back of a car, maybe on the back of a Ford, or maybe on a, or maybe on a baseball cap. <laughs> but it doesn't ring true because the facts don't reflect that. And I think, again, the people of Ontario have a higher expectation. And they deserve, they deserve aspiring premiers and leaders who, who actually want to level with them on all of these topics. So it doesn't mean that we shouldn't continue to invest in our talent pipeline. We should, and we are as a government. I referenced that just a few minutes ago. Uh, but to suggest that when you're creating jobs every single, every single week, to suggest that when your GDP is leading not only the country but the G7, that when you, when you have the low, uh, lower unemployment today than you've had for any point in the last 17 years, to suggest that the province is not prosperous, to me, is just patently untrue. Doesn't mean we can't do better, and that's why we're making the investments that we are making as a government. So on the Amazon bid, uh, the competitive process there, you, you said that we didn't offer all kinds of money and we didn't. incentives. Yeah. I know that from our work here that some of the U.S. states are pretty aggressive uh, in trying to recruit and lure sure. companies, even to relocate from Ontario, yes. and offer them all kinds of stuff. My, my sense of it is that the reason that we're in that running and that Google, for example, does sidewalk labs right. here in Toronto, the, the, the province has for a, a long time now, over 10 years, made these pretty significant investments and has been talking about producing a highly trained, highly skilled workforce. You talked about STEM, right? Yeah. Science, technology, engineering, engineering and mathematics. Math. Yep. So are we, is, is this kind of our new place in the global economy? Are, are we building an economy that's based on really smart people graduating from our system and hopefully staying here and not leaving for Silicon Valley or wherever else the yeah. masters may be greener? I mean, that is a huge component of our, um, of our, I'll call it skills training agenda, but it's also a huge part of our economic, um, our economic agenda for the next number of years. We know that for a province like ours with the quality of life that we have, we know that if we want to continue to create and then lure the kind of investment that will support jobs that pay well, that compensate our workers well, 
that we need to focus on the six or seven inches between our, our population's ears, you know, our brains. We need to make sure that we're using, um, we're using our investments to support that kind, of, that kind of outcome. And that's really why, as, as I mentioned, as you've mentioned, the STEM increase in terms of the graduates. Think about that for a quick second. When we've completed that over the next few years, Ontario will be the number one STEM graduating producing, if that's the right phrase, a place yielding. in North America, <laughs> yielding in North America on a per capita basis. When you think about artificial intelligence, when you think about yeah. automated and connected technology, nanotechnology, 5G, all of this stuff is, it's a fundamental part of the economy that sits right in front of us today, but certainly the economy that we're going to see over the next number of years. I would also say, uh, while it's really important for us to be in that space, my ministry, working closely with the Ministry of Advanced Education and Skills Development, also wants to make sure that in our manufacturing sector, in our construction sector, that we continue to have skilled tradespeople that are proud to pursue careers in that realm, in those sectors. Uh, and, uh, and I know that we have a bit of a challenge. I've heard that. I was in Windsor yesterday and spoke to some folks in the, um, in the mold making industry, for example. They talked about the demographic shifts that they're seeing within the industrial base, within their manufacturing sector, and the need for new talent, and the need to actually encourage more women to consider careers in the trades. It's actually a pretty fascinating process that they're going through in places like Windsor. I was in Aurelia just uh, the day before yesterday and heard the same concern being expressed there. So we need to make sure we're constantly investing in innovation, but we also have to make sure that we have the workforce that can fill all of the gaps that we're going to have. So last question I, I want to ask you. So it's great we're producing highly trained, highly skilled, super smart people. We have some that work here are really <laughs> smart people. Our entire uh, crew uh, that produces this show is, is basically one guy with a bit of help. So he's a pretty smart guy. Absolutely. Um, your, your ministry uh, does have uh, some uh, industrial subsidy programs. It yep. does has had and predates you, um, a Jobs and Prosperity Fund, yep. and then yep. there was the Strategic Jobs and Investment Fund. So there has been a, there have been programs yep. and tools that the Ontario government has to recruit or retain businesses that are employment, uh, good employers yep. here in the province. Um, your, your principal opponent, Mr. Ford, has said that he <coughs> absolutely opposes what he calls corporate welfare and that when, if and when the time comes where he wants to either recruit or retain a company in Ontario, that he'll do so through tax incentives. So a couple of questions. One is, I, I think, I've been around this stuff long enough to know that if the province spends a dollar or gives someone a tax credit for a dollar, the impact on Treasury is the same. Yeah. And, and secondly, how, how can you, uh, you're being in the minister's chair right now, can, is, is it feasible to kind mm -hmm. of go at these companies kind of one at a time and say, I'll, I'll do this tax incentive for you, but I'll do this tax incentive for you? How, how, do you how would you administer such a program? Yeah, I mean, this, this strikes me as an, uh, yet another kind of bizarre, uh, bizarre approach that uh, Doug Ford's suggesting he would take if he were ever to become premier of the province. In a way, I'm not surprised to hear a conservative leader talk about the need uh, to not support strategic investments in companies in our economy. Uh, many people watching will remember, again, nine, ten years ago when our government, working with the then federal government, decided that it was critically important the to Harper step in. Right? But it was critically important for our liberal government, working with the feds, to step in and help support Ontario's auto sector, for example, which was facing yeah. some real tough times back in 08, 09. Conservatives in that moment here provincially said, we, we shouldn't be doing that. They have consistently criticized us for making the decision to support some really, really important employment producing sectors. I can tell you, there are more than 800,000 people who work directly and indirectly in our auto sector here in this province. That's 800,000 families that frankly still are employed today, are supported today, have a good quality of life because government stepped in and supported them with strategic investments a decade ago. And I think it's actually really sad that Mr. Ford would suggest that that's not the kind of move that we should be looking at, that we should be developing policy kind of on a whim, on the back of a napkin. It just, that's not, that's not an industrial strategy, that's not an economic blueprint, that's a recipe for disaster. We're, we're not gonna go down that path. We've had success 
with the strategic investments that we've been making all across this province, creating jobs, supporting families, and building a really, really flourishing and sustainable economy. And that's what we're going to continue to focus on. Okay. Well, I want to thank you very much for your time and um, for sharing your thoughts uh, with the people watching. You notice I didn't ask you what's going to be in the budget. <laughs> I figured you'd have a really eloquent way of telling me to buzz off. <laughs> so um, we'll be back next Friday uh, to talk more about the Ontario scene, if you will. Um, today is March 16th, and just before we sign off, uh, we want to say uh, tomorrow being March 17th, uh, happy St. Patrick's Day to all of our uh, Irish friends. And for those who don't know, March 19th is St. Joseph's Day, which for Italians is like Father's Day. So happy right. Father's Day to all the Italian-Canadian uh, men out there and yeah. our Italian-Canadian dads. And Stephen, anyone you want to say hi to? Good point. I mean, I would agree. Happy St. Patrick's Day. And as Joe, Joe mentioned, uh, the, the Feast of St. Joseph coming up. Uh, but I would also say to all, of our, to all of our Persians watching and others watching, Next week will be no ruse. So happy no ruse to, uh, to those who will be celebrating. Uh, and happy spring. Looking forward go. to it. All right. Thanks, everyone, for joining us. We'll see you next Friday.